Welcome back to the Sports Not interview. NFL rule changes. That's a subject for today. And to talk about that, we bring in NFL.com's Jeffrey Chadia, who's going to run us through all this. So, Jeffrey, uh, obviously, a couple big changes come out of the owners' meeting, starting first with the hip drop tackle. That has been banned from the league, so defenders can no longer use it. Out of 22,000 tackles plus last year, there was maybe a couple hundred of the hip drop tackles as it's defined. Talk a little bit about the the onus behind doing this, making sure that it's no longer part of the league, and then also the impact it will have on the defenders who have to now uh, spay, spay, uh, excuse me, pay special attention to uh, how they're bringing down the opponent. Yeah, well, first of all, it's important to know it's a specific type of hip drop tackle that they're talking about, which is defenders grabbing players from behind and then landing on their legs, dropping their weight to make the tackle. The NFL feels like that type of tackle is incredibly dangerous. Their research shows that the injury rate for that is about 20 times more than a regular tackle. And so they want to ban it from the game. And obviously NFL players, defensive players, the NFL pay are not happy about this. There's been a number of things the league has done over the last 10, 15 years to try to make their job harder. You know, I think it is, a, it, it does need to lead the game. It's mm -hmm. not like the horse collar tackle was. Uh, a few years ago where players were getting hurt a lot on that. And ultimately, players found a way to tackle without using a horse collar. That will happen with the hip drop, but it's not fun for defenders who have to deal with bigger, faster, stronger men that they're trying to bring down. Yeah, I know a lot of the players who who were not in favor of it using that. You keep putting these rules on defenders, and defenders suddenly are at a disadvantage. But overall, I mean, listen, I, I credit the NFL because I think player safety, right, has been at the forefront of the conversation, and this is just another uh, situation where you're doing that. My question for you on this, because because I agree with it. I'm not a player in the NFL, of course, but I agree with it. But then my only question is. How tough is this going to be able to call on the field? Are we going to see more calls? Are we going to see fines versus suspensions if it continues? How do you see that all kind of ironing itself out? Well, anytime they try to emphasize a new rule, you're going to see it called more. So I do expect that to happen. I do wonder how they're going to deal with the fining situation because it is a little bit unfair if you're doing this in a game and then you're getting hit with a fine afterwards. I think mm. the point's already been made. <laughs> <laughs> with the yellow flag coming out. I wish it was like the college football situation where you would actually have a targeting play and then referees would go look at the replay to see if it actually yes. was targeting. Yes. I, I do agree with you. I think it's such a bang, bang type play. And I do think a lot like roughing the past or other rules where you have things happen really quickly that officials are going to make mistakes. It, it, it's going to not be easy to adjudicate, but this is the way the league is going. Yeah, no doubt about it. The other, one of the other big rules that we talk about change was obviously the kickoff rules. And this one is really interesting as I've been watching the reaction of football fans is, you know, I hear a lot of people when they're critical of the league say, well, why don't, why doesn't the league do something different? Why don't they do something to increase, for example, kickoffs, all this stuff. So you see what the XFL did. The NFL took a page out of that book. The new kickoff rules are there uh, and, and you can link to them below if you want to see a, a better understanding of them. But when you look at this, I like this because I think it, it will bring more excitement to kickoffs while at the same time, protecting players so that you're not having somebody run 70 yards and having a massive collision. You're starting closer together. But is this going to be the return of the kick returner with these new rules? Well, you hope so. I've missed that part of the game, and it's really been pushed out over the last four or five years with the way the league has tried to change the kickoff uh, to make it better and safer for players. But, yeah, it's uh, I give the league credit for looking, first of all, looking to another league for an idea. This is why you have the XFL, the UFL, all these places, because they can do different things and try different things out. So, like you, I am curious to see how it's going to look. I don't have the numbers, the research to know how many big returns came off of it, but it feels like it's going to be more like, like a scrimmage play where you yeah. just have blockers and you have a guy who's really deep with the football and, and that person's going to have to make a play in a specified amount of room. And so I, I wonder if you can get different bodies now involved in the kickoff. Mm. You get fewer big body guys who are wedge blockers 
more linebacker safeties type. And if, if the returner themselves are more like punt returners, quicker, more agile guys than speedy guys who were doing kickoffs. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is how it impacts when you're roster building for special teams. Like you said, you you want a different skill set than maybe you wanted on traditional kick returns, right? Yeah, and, and really going back to the first question you had about uh, hip drops, it, mm -hmm. uh, you got to have guys who can tackle out there now. You just can't <laughs> have guys running down the field and crashing into each other. You have to have a little more sophistication in who's doing the tackling and who's doing the blocking. So I know in the past, like Seattle, when Pete Carroll was there, was very big on having starting players, defensive players on special teams. And so you saw guys like Richard Sherman or mm -hmm. K.J. Wright, guys like that running down and covering kicks. I wouldn't be surprised if you saw more special teams coaches asking more starters to be in, involved, or at least if you saw more teams trying to keep a guy who's more of a linebacker safety type than a lineman just for those kinds of, those kinds of situations. Yeah, especially close games and you're getting close to the end of the oh, game yeah. and you got to kick the ball off. You know, you want to have your guys out there to make sure that uh, somebody doesn't break one through. It's going to be interesting. The only thing I would ask you, Jeffrey, is can you go to the league and ask them to go back to the XFL too and, and get the sky judge? Oh, that's just me. <laughs> but don't worry. <laughs> oh, about no, I, I, no, that's a wrap. Oh, you don't want to go down with those guys. <laughs> I know, with the officiating, it's a tough one. Uh, but let me ask you this too. One of the other things that the NFL uh, ruled on and changed at the owner's meeting was they're moving the trade deadline to after week nine. And one of the things that I've always liked about the trade deadline in the NFL is it really kept, I think, the integrity, the competitive integrity of the league because teams couldn't dump salaries, dump guys at the end of a season uh, because they were, let's say, not having a great season. Instead, having it there. But now you move it a week. How might this, I mean, this gives GMs a lot more flexibility. Um, what do you think the thinking was behind this? Well, the NFL has seen a huge boost in the attention paid to the trade deadline. And I would say, God, when I first started covering football over 20 years ago, nothing would happen at the trade <laughs> deadline because guys would be so conservative and so worried about making a bad deal or not knowing where their players were, where their teams were at, and what players they had to get rid of, that they just wouldn't do anything. And now in the last you know four or five years, you've seen teams be way more aggressive in making moves. And some of those moves have ended up delivering – championships to, to certain teams. I think about the Rams going out and getting Von Miller a couple of years ago as a key piece to what they wanted to do or Odell Beckham Jr. And, and so, you know, th those kind of moves are a big factor in what happens to teams down the road. So I think having more time allows GMs to be more flexible. You're seeing more teams be in it later in the season. Mm -hmm. So ultimately that encourages more teams to be to be willing to make some moves. And I think it'll be more fun. I think the off the field stuff now has become so big in the NFL that people love any kind of personnel trade acquisition stuff like it's fantasy football in real life. Yeah, it reminds me when I was younger, when I was a kid, the baseball trade deadline was always so big, right? Because you had teams out of contention. They trade a slugger to a team that was in contention. And I think you're seeing that more in the NFL. And you're right. I think people get more excited about it. Doing a, a football talk show like I do as well, uh, on the radio, same thing, man. When it's when it's coming down to the deadline, people get really excited about it. So it'll be interesting. The NFL itself, I mean, listen, it's it's amazing how much this has become a, a part of American life, especially when it comes to sports. Of course, the NFL now with the Christmas games and and now a Wednesday game coming up in the off season. Uh, it just goes to show you every year the top television shows in the country are football games. Uh, talk about that and how the NFL saying in the past, hey, we're not going to do a game on Wednesday, but now with the holiday there and they know people are home, people look at it as part of their tradition, don't they? Yeah, they won't do a game on Wednesday until they see the ratings <laughs> and the money that can be made for those Wednesday games when everybody's yes. at home looking for something to do in the afternoon. So that you know, they haven't hidden the fact that that's a big driving point behind doing this. They saw the numbers they did last year with the Christmas Day games. That Ravens-Niners game was a big deal. Chiefs lost to the Raiders. You had a number of games that had playoff implications. And so they want to continue to grow that market, especially as they get into trying to stream games. That's a big part of what they want to do. The only thing I'm concerned with, and we talked about a lot about player safety with the kickoff and the hip drop tackle, again, you're putting players now into a very difficult spot where you're asking them to play games on Wednesday and then come back, whether that's – 10 days down the road, you're going to have a short week in there and the recovery time is going to be tough. So Thursday games are already a bear for players and they will tell you that I'm sure playing on Christmas, even with the money their teams can make, there's going to be some grumbling about that too. 
Yeah, and I know I know the players uh, from from last off season. There was a lot of talk about the NFL wanting to actually go to eighteen weeks, right? So we went to seventeen weeks and then eighteen weeks. And I know a lot of the players and the players union was a little against that, clearly because of the safety issue. But if you add an eighteenth week, you could perhaps do schedules where if you do have a game like that, or if you have an international game, it would give you more time off so that you could do it. Now I know for the schedulers and the computers they used to do it, it might be a challenge, but that's something they could think about. Right. Is if you extend the season um, and, and you get the players and, and you do that, you can actually uh, uh, be able to schedule better and maybe factor that in. Yeah, you can create more opportunities. Maybe even I don't know how you do this, but maybe even double by in, in some situations. Yeah, there's yeah. more opportunities to be more creative with it. I think ultimately what comes down to having a schedule in the 18 game range is you're going to have to just have bigger rosters. Mm-hmm. That's always been the fight. Do the owners want to actually pay more players? to be more involved because, you know, they've got pretty much a, a, an expanded practice squad, which has become like a taxi squad where you can keep veterans on there. But you're probably going to have to add about five or six players at least to a roster because you've seen even this past year coming down a stretch, how many teams were impacted by injuries to key players. Mm-hmm. It's just at 17 games, you're feeling the effect. I imagine at 18 games, it's going to be even harder to keep guys healthy. Lastly, on the the international side, right? So you have now, of course, Brazil, a game coming on the schedule. The NFL has, not, I mean, it, it needs to grow. It wants to grow. It, it understands that there's people outside of the United States who like football. It's been Mexico. The London games have been very successful. I've been over there. I was shocked how many Londoners are walking around in jerseys from all the teams. Yeah. I couldn't find yeah. one favorite team. They like right. everybody. Uh, but you look at that, is the, is the ultimate goal here to have some teams outside the United States uh, permanently, or do you think this is going to be kind of steady state for the next while as far as the international scene goes? Oh, I think they would love to have a team outside of the States. And London's always been the most sensible area. You know, mm. The question is logistics and attracting players and travel and all the things we're talking about now, 18-game schedules. But really, what's, what's going to help the league with any kind of international push is always going to be our kids playing your game. Mm-hmm. And so you go to other countries, they're playing basketball. You, know, you go to other countries, they're playing baseball. And so the NFL has been trying to crack that code for a while now. I really believe that flag football may be their their entry point because that's a game you can play in a lot of different places. You don't have to be huge and massive or even male to do it. And so I, I want they're really pushing flag football hard, and that may open the door to them to be able to get a, even a younger fan base into football as they try to grow it outside of the states. Yeah, it's a great way to do it because not only is it lower cost for kids, uh, especially if they're, you know, if they're in a middle income family where it's tough to come up with the money to play tackle football, but they learn the game. And that's the most important thing, as you said, learning the game of, of football. So then eventually when you're when you're old enough or you reach a certain point, you can play tackle football. So I agree with you. It's also the fastest growing sport in America, along with lacrosse. So uh, that's, I think, a lot of credit to the NFL for that, because I know with their NFL flag program, they continue to grow across the country. Jeffrey Kadia, I appreciate you spending so much time with us, and uh, we'll check out your work on NFL.com. We'll talk to you down the line. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. I appreciate you.